Let's keep it going. Next up, to give you the story of the Raiders of Tut's Tomb, Archaeology, Curses, and Theft, Egan Hervela. Hello? Okay, cool. Hi. Hi, I'm Egan, uh, and tonight I want to talk to you about archaeology, curses, and theft, and specifically about the men who uh, wanted to find all this first. But uh, to follow up on the theme about curses, I want to start tonight off with a curse. So, uh, 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 all people who enter this tomb, who will make evil against this tomb and destroy it, may the cro crocodiles be against them on water. May the snakes be against them on land. May the hippopotamus be against them on water. And may the scorpions be against them on land. So this was, a, this was a typical curse that could be found on a lot of tombs that were uncovered in Egypt at the time. This particular one was found on a, an, an actually an unnamed uh, ancient Egyptian official and his wife. Um, the problem is, though, like is curses great. like this didn't really work. Uh, oh, oh, that, uh, cursed. This place. Oh, uh, it's not working. Okay, anyways, funny, funny movie clip. What do you um, think you and curses? Yeah, I ain't happy with that. Good curse. This is curse. That is curse. Give it a rest, will ya? So. Okay. So the problem is that uh, tomb robbing had um, always been an issue for Egyptian people. Uh, it was commonly known that uh, the ancient kings were buried with their worldly uh, possessions, you know, ranging from gold and gems, but also included things like games, furniture, chariots, mummified animals. Um, originally, many of the early pharaohs uh, were buried in the Great Pyramids, uh, like the ones that were found on the, on the, on the, uh, the Giza Plateau. Uh, it should be noted that the uh, ancient Egyptians uh, felt that any sort of sacrilege to these tombs was... Pretty, pretty unquestionable. It was, it was unthinkable. It was like the pharaohs were regarded as near divinity, uh, and it wasn't until the, uh, the, it wasn't in the mindset of the ruling class to consider this really mob robbery a thing. Um, it's important also to remember that, that the relics of these of the past still have a significant meaning to the Egyptian people. Uh, but despite com uh, com uh, complex layouts and purposefully placed uh, false treasuries. Uh, these kind of tombs just ended up being like come rob me markers. Uh, they just were just too exposed and too obvious. So during the New Kingdom, uh, the Egypt's New Kingdom, uh, during uh, 1539 to 1075 BC, the ancient kings started to bury their dead in an area of uh, the west side of the Nile near Luxor. This area is known as the Valley of the Tomb of the Kings. Uh, it was chosen primarily because of uh, the number of dead, uh, dead end canyons and complex uh, natural layouts of the region. Uh, there were reported to be about 60 known uh, tombs discovered there with over 100 rooms and chambers. Uh, and they're still finding new stuff like today. Um, still, the robberies did not end. Uh, the first recorded tomb robbing uh, uh, occurred during the reign of Ramses IX, uh, right around like 1124 BC and 1106 BC. Uh, it's been going on ever since. Here's a, uh, here's a more uh, detailed uh, map of the valley and, and the principal tombs found thus far. Robbing tombs was, uh, was not an easy task. It required a team of people um, to, commit the, to commit the crime, really. The gangs numbered uh, upward about 10 people, usually. There were um, people who, uh, there were tomb robbers included laborers, stonemasons, water carriers, lamp carriers. Um, and once the treasure was removed, uh, and uh, they were buried oftentimes in caches and hidden away, or they were basically melted down or sold to unscrupulous trade and, uh, traders in antiquities. Um, Another interesting note about the, about the mentality behind the ancient tomb robbers, it's true that many robberies were done by common thieves. Um, but it was actually wasn't all that uncommon for like, future pharaohs to take over old, you know, defiled tombs and just take them as their own. Um, it, the, the, the idea was that uh, the tomb's already defiled, it's not gonna piss off the gods anymore, we'll just use this one, it's okay. Um, so several centuries later, the British took over uh, the rule of Egypt in 1882 during the Anglo-Egyptian War. Uh, this, uh, this also coincided with Napoleon's military, military campaign um, all over North Africa. So pictured here is um, uh, a drawing of a, the famous encounter between Napoleon and the Sphinx. Uh, by the way, it's a total myth that um, the nose of the Sphinx was blown off by one of Napoleon's cannons. Uh, it had been missing for quite a while before he got there. So, and it's still kind of debatable about exactly what happened with it. Um, soon after this, a huge wave of Egyptomania swept over England. It was very much in vogue to have... Um, and, and collect various artifacts that were, and curios that were coming out of Egypt at this time. Later on, it became even more in vogue, and you could actually say, like, 
put a historical reference to the artifacts um, that one owns. So for instance, like this tablet dates back to Ramses II the, the during the 19th dynasty. Um, many, would be, many would be archeologists flock to Egypt in the hopes of finding their own fame and fortune. So on May 9th, uh, 9th uh, 1874, Howard Carter was born uh, to Samuel and Martha Carter in Swatham, England. Uh, being the youngest child of the family, there wasn't enough money for him to go to a proper school. Um, additionally, he was kind of, he was reported to basically be kind of like a sickly and kind of like, kind of unhealthy little kid. Um, nonetheless, young Howard um, enjoyed spending his time uh, in the nearby uh, uh, Dindling, Dindlington Hall uh, and marveled at all the artifacts from Egypt that were collected there. Howard, Howard uh, shared his father's um, artistic skills. And when he was old enough, he followed in his father's footsteps and became a painter. Uh, this eventually led and brought him to Egypt, and he was uh, tasked with transform, uh, transcribing hieroglyphs and paintings from tomb walls uh, that were being discovered. Howard Carter eventually found work um, at, as the chief inspector of an antiquities in Upper Egypt. Uh, his boss was Sir William Matthew Flinders Petrie. As the story goes, Carter uh, got into a bit of an altercation uh, with some rude uh, tourist one day. Apparently there was like chair throwing, it was kind of a mess, and uh, he lost his job. Uh, quickly running out of money after this, uh, he was finally introduced to George Herbert, the fifth Earl of uh, uh, Carnarvon. Lord Carnarvon uh, came, to, uh, came from one of the richest families in England at the time, and I'd love to race cars, uh, kind of a bit of an adventure. Unfortunately, Lord Carnarvon got into a pretty severe uh, car accident, which left him uh, relying on a cane to walk, and it, it caused uh, permanent chest injuries. Uh, Carnarvon uh, was also an avid uh, fan of all things Egyptian and was happy to fund Carter on an expedition that Carter had in mind and would actually end up being kind of one of the most important archaeological finds ever. Um, from Carter's uh, studies, he knew that a boy king by the name of Tutankhamun was the heir to, uh, to King Anakten of, of the 18th dynasty. Tutankhamun was said to have uh, returned to Thebes during, the, during his rule, coming up from the lower Egypt to the north. Uh, he was also noted for, uh, for returning uh, the old religious practices, which was um, uh, uh, more of a, a pantheon style of a worship, from the, mono, uh, the monotheistic uh, one that his predecessor had enacted. It's still not 100% sure whether or not um, a Tut Tutankhamun was a Noctan's son, but evidence kind of paints, points to that. Uh, Tut was only nine when he took the throne, and it's believed that he died when he was about 19. Most notably, uh, there were no, no temple records of any tomb robberies in, of Tut's tomb, so, the, so it was an indication that the tomb had not been defiled yet. And this is important because um, uh, a lot of the priests kept track of like, when tombs were robbed, so, like, and there was nothing like this about Tut's tomb at that time, or discovered at least. In 1914, both Carter and Carnarvon started their search for the tomb, for the tomb of Tutankhamun. After nearly eight years of searching, with very little to show for their work, they stumbled across something. It's said that one of the workers discovered a set of stairs while retrieving some water jugs leading down into an as-of-yet undiscovered tomb. Um, after digging further, they, need, they indeed found what had been, uh, they had been searching for. Carter was famously asked by Lord Carnarvon uh, when he saw uh, what he saw, and Carter, when he first peered into the tomb, going through the, the opening tunnels and you know getting into the going past the first. Uh, you know, barrier for the first time, using only a candle for illumination. Um, he, and his, his response was, wonderful things. Uh, Carter's discovery was indeed revolutionary. No other tomb up until this, up until this find was even remotely as intact as, or undisturbed. According to the Egyptian laws at the time, though, uh, at least half of, the, of anything found in, in the tombs would go to the Egyptian museum, and the other half would go to the expedition that found it. Uh, this, however, only applied to previously plundered tombs, uh, since an intact tomb had never been found. So there wasn't really a protocol, uh, and it was only speculation about uh, what would happen to one if ever was discovered. Anyone want to take a guess what happened? Um, yeah. Uh, so it's no big surprise that just about all of the artifacts that were taken from Tut's tomb uh, and then subsequently left Egypt. So currently, the entire value of the treasure found ranged from 650 to 600 million, 80 million dollars in total. So, what about the what about the curse of the pharaohs that we mentioned earlier, right? Well, it's commonly known that um, at the at the exact time uh, that Howard's uh, Howard and Carnarvon entered the Tut's tomb, a cobra crept into went into Carter's uh, canary cage that he had back in his home, uh, and ate the poor bird head first. Some of, some of the locals saw this and saw that it was a terrible omen. They thought it was just like, oh, it's the Pharaoh's curse. There was also, back in uh, England at the time, there was a publicist, an author, who was basically kind of like stirring up this whole, you know, Pharaoh's curse stuff. Um, it's also true that Lord Carnarvon died shortly after the opening of the tomb. It was about two weeks. 
uh, from complications resulting from a mosquito bite and a shaving accident. He basically cut himself and uh, it got infected. So Lord, Lord Carnarvon's dog also passed away um, around the same time. But the thing is, like, only about of, of the fifty-eight people that were that were um, with the dis with the discovery, only about eight died within the, the dozen or so years after uh, the tomb's opening. I know it's like it was like oh, you know, it was more coincidence than anything. Um, Carter himself died when in, in nineteen thirty-nine due to, to lymphoma. But here's the thing: here's the real curse of what of what really of any of this. I mean, the real curse is this. So, so when I was reading about this, so there is there is there's a story about how. Carter, when he was first sailing away from Tut's tomb with a, on a barge going down the Nile uh, and with his first hauls from the tomb, and apparently several native Egyptians gathered and crowded around the Nile and uh, around the banks and were wailing. I mean, there was just this funerary wailing about, about the sacrilege that had been done to the pharaoh's uh, resting place. So it's arguable whether what, that what Carter did and other archaeologists did could be considered preservation or was it just another form of theft? Considering how frequently the old tombs had been raided in the past, was it only a matter of time before Tut's tomb fell prey to the same fate? Uh, I mean, and then there's the argument now that, uh, but what about the treasures? Can I mean, can they be returned to Egypt? So good news on this front. It's already happening. So the Met in New York City has already returned about 19 of the artifacts that were found, and are now they're now residing in the Grand Egyptian Museum in Giza, and more are actually showing up in Giza. And so, so good news about that. So one can only hope uh, that the treasures that remains, these treasures remain safe there, and for all to see and appreciate and more will eventually find their way home. Thanks. <laughs>